Good morning and welcome to the latest in our series of V3 Breakfasts, which, as you've probably gathered, is about food. I actually think at this moment in time, food is maybe the world's most exciting industry. Food systems, by their very nature, are also highly complex, and that poses something of a challenge if we're going to really change the way that the world does food. I think we actually got it wrong by calling it Food Systems 4.0 this morning, because uh, 4.0 was a term coined by the World Economic Forum, and they said globalization, globalization 4.0, and they meant everything transformed by technology, that we would have to stop clinging to old processes and adopt a totally new mindset for everything. But they sort of left out that we also need to change our behavior. So what we talk about working uh, on food systems in this building is actually Food Systems 5.0, where we really start to understand how it is that we connect people and technology together so that we change the way we all behave and we have food systems that are truly capable of sustaining 10 billion people on the planet who will need to be fed and thrive and uh, live well in 2050. So that's sort of what we're talking about this morning. Uh, we have two speakers, three panelists, and we're also going to hear about some research that we've done together with YouGov. Um, we're going to quickly hear about that from Laura. Well, same people. Hello, everyone. Morning. So first of all, for everyone in the room, I would really like it if you could please raise your hand if you're worried about the potential reduction in food resources due to climate change. Lovely. Good crowd. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. So from our data that we kind of collected, 58% of the people that we asked said that they are also worried about the potential reduction in food resources due to climate change. But the really interesting thing about this is that it's not enough to change their buying habits. We also found out that they're not necessarily prepared to pay more for environmentally friendly foods. So 81% of those people that we surveyed said that cost was still the most important thing to them when they were shopping for food. It looks like we've got a bit of an issue. Um, people obviously want to do the right thing, but they're not really doing it yet. And as Philip said, it's all kind of like to do with behaviour and how we can kind of like change that way of thinking. We obviously care about it, but not really enough. Um, so hopefully this morning is going to sort of shed some light on that. And um, if we're all feeling brave enough, we might start a revolution. But just to explain how this morning is going to work, uh, Diane will talk to us. I'm going to ask some questions of our panellists, so if you could just hold those in your head while Diane is talking and then answer them afterwards, that would be amazing. So, Diane. Diane is a big foodie who has never drunk Coca-Cola, coffee or beer in his entire life. He grew up in Russia, he's lived around Europe and he's passionate about sustainability, which is why he started Department 22. <laughs> I look at design as a, as a tool that can really be world-changing. And so in the last 10 years, I've been focusing mainly on projects which are related to sustainability. And three years ago, my colleagues and I set up Department 22. What we do is we are predominantly designers in our team. So we use design as our main tool. We're driven by sustainability challenges and problems, but we like to see them as opportunities uh, for interventions which, in, which can really improve things around us. But today, I want to focus on, digesting, uh, on uh, dissecting, <laughs> <laughs> dissecting those food systems. And I'm going to actually dissect something here today. Staple food that we all have pretty much every day. A sandwich. <clears throat> the shell. Made of plastic. And we all know plastic is really bad, right? Anyone disagree with that? I kind of disagree with that, thank you. I think plastic, you know, 50 years ago we said plastic, fantastic. It was the kind of big thing that really changed our lives. The problem is that we design it in the wrong ways and we use it in the wrong ways, especially single-use plastic. Although recycling is good, it's not ideal, but the worst thing that can happen is that it can end up in landfill or even worse, in the oceans. It's harming our whole environment, so it's killing 
animals. It's destroying nature, wildlife. This is an image, by the way, of all the plastic that was found in one bird's stomach. It's horrible. You think that's really sad, but you should think further and think that's actually ending up in our stomachs as well as microplastics that we eat through fish. But in this talk, I don't want to talk too much about problems. I mean, I do want to address them, but I also want to talk about some solutions. This is one of my favorite examples of a circular design solution. This is called Cup Club. Instead of taking it disposable cups, you can take it in one of these um, plastic cups, but they are reusable. And there's a whole product slash service that goes along with it. So you take it in one shop, you can drop it off at certain points in, in the city, and then it gets washed and reused, and it can be reused something around 150 times before it has to be recycled. Without looking at products as waste, but as nutrients for something else. So it's all keep keeping all of our resources in circulation for as long as possible in many different ways. And actually, it's mimicking what nature is doing. We are probably the only beings on this planet that have waste. Let's look at the bread. Bread. It's a staple food of many of us. We love it. But the real thing I want to focus on here is specifically the sandwich industry and the problems around that. Almost 50% of bread that's produced never gets eaten. That's crazy. That's really, really shocking. Next in our sandwich, some lettuce. <laughs> hey! Sometimes in a week they can import something like 30,000 heads of lettuce from the US. It's crazy. Here I want to talk to you about a project that we've actually developed at Department 22. This is one of our recent projects which is called Walter H5, and it allows people to grow food in their homes all year round, inside or, or outside on their balcony or in their garden. Next, I'm going to look at protein. In this case, it's chicken. We can have you know, all sorts of protein sources in our sandwiches. Chicken is one of the most common ones, and actually in the UK we eat about 2.2 million chickens every day. What is the problem with that? Well, actually, here I don't want to talk about the problem of chickens themselves, but actually what the chickens eat. Feed for chickens is soy, which is great. It's easy to grow. It can grow in many places, and we then feed it to chickens. But the problem is we need a lot of land for that. So what we do is we cut down forests, sometimes beautiful rainforests like the Amazon. And the issue with that, apart from cutting down beautiful nature that we have, is that in, you know, in a rainforest like this, in one square meter, you would have more than a thousand species of plants growing. It's a whole mini ecosystem just in one square meter. But actually, we cut that down, and we have just one crop growing there. That destroys the ecosystem. I want to look at a great solution here of how we can find protein in other sources. And there was a hint, actually, for you at the breakfast here, and Philip mentioned it, looking at insects. <coughs> insects are actually really, really efficient in terms of how they, you know, the protein that they produce. Think about it. 20 years ago, who would eat raw fish in the UK? Now we love sushi. Same could happen with insects. This is a project by an, um, a Swedish architecture company called Bellachu Architects, Bellachu Labs, and they've looked at how we can use infrastructure already existent in cities, such as roundabouts, to build these buildings called buzz buildings and grow insects directly there to feed the whole city. Next on our sandwich is cheese. We've got all sorts of cheese that we eat. Uh, most of it comes from cow's milk. And the issue with cow's milk is mainly the way we produce it now. Most of it is done through intensive farming and it really disconnects us from nature. It disconnects us from understanding where it's made. You know, we have this picture of cows grazing on beautiful grasslands, but that's not really true. Floating farms, in fact, this project is called Floating Farms, which are dairy farms where cows live on the top level and all the milk is pasteurized in the, in the underground level and yogurt is produced there and then actually the cows have access to um, 
grass pastures outside of um, the rafts or on the <coughs> land. It's not going to solve the problem of dairy, but it will connect us to understanding it better and, and really show what can be done. So this is a sandwich. And it's, as you can see, this is this, the issues that I talked about are not specific to this sandwich in particular, or any sandwich or any food. It's a much broader problem. Actually, we're wasting so much food. And if anyone tells you that we're, we're going to struggle to feed the population, the growing population on this planet, that's really, I don't really agree with that. We just need to redesign the way we produce food, the way we consume food, and the food systems in order to feed it. It's not that we're going to have lack of food. We just need to make use of, better use of the food that we already have and produce. I just want to finish on one last slide, really to, to emphasize the fact that we, you know, I, I've uncovered some scary truth, but what I really hope you will take away from this is that those inspirational ideas and solutions that people are coming up with, and hopefully this will inspire you to think about food systems and, and solving these issues and how we can create a better world. Thank you. We have a panel and three members of our panel. So please step up. So with all of this, we're, I guess, thinking very creatively and innovating to deal with problems that come from current systems. Is there, is there an end game that everyone's working to that is the sort of the new food systems, which Maybe our, we're only sort of 1% into that journey so far, but it, we all know that that's where we want it to end up. So and uh, for example, will we all be eating insects? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> we'll come back to the insects. Um, for us at UK Harvest, our end game is not having to exist anymore. Um, we redistribute food, um, and that's the core part of our charity. However, the big part for us is education around behavioural change as well so that we get ourselves out of the problem and inst instigate that behavioural yeah. change. What's your end game? Is it we're eating all our packaging? <laughs> <laughs> a plastic bottle takes 700 years to decompose, but on average we use it for 20 minutes. And I suppose what we're looking at is that aspect, that if you were using a chair that's been made out of plastic, you might have it for 30 years, so suddenly 700 years doesn't seem so bad, but when you're using something for 20, 30 minutes and then it's going to take 700 years to get rid of, it doesn't seem as sort of worth it. Yeah. Very shocking. So again. A really interesting piece of research actually came out um, from the uh, Ohio State University, which um, they basically put jugs of milk in front of participants um, without date labels and some with, with like an expiry date. And people f found older milk acceptable when it didn't have a date on it than like if there's a, as soon as we just put this black and white date on, on food, suddenly all of our logic jumps out the window and we just see this as like the end authority and final say on food freshness just because it's there and it's a number and it's hard data and um, what we're trying to do is try to educate people to understand when we sh when it is okay to use food until and actually you can f push food really much further than you think um, and, and we're trying to show people that we're moving further and further away from knowing where our food comes food's now global so we're we're all eating things that came from another part of the world which 50 or 60 years ago we never would have had someone recently you know, joe wicks or someone you know to, is in costa rica and took a picture of a pineapple on a tree and people are like pineapples grow on trees in the ground <laughs> like how they, you know just didn't understand where they came from and i think to me the industrialization and the globalization of food are what's created this divide between knowing that yeah. so it's a re-education rather yeah. than an education Excellent. Excellent point. Sorry. On the education, I suppose we found in our aspect, because it's a new product and people are struggling maybe to understand with a new thing how you use it or why you need to use it. And it's not so much that they haven't been educated or their education is wrong, it's just when something's new they need more knowledge to go with it. And we found like when we were giving out them at the marathon, people are struggling sometimes on how they eat them, why they need to eat them, or can they swallow it? If they, if they don't swallow it, is it going to be bad if, to the environment? Or, you know, <coughs> why do you want to eat it? We wouldn't eat it normally. And I suppose it's just part of the thing when you get new products and new objects and new foods, if it's not something you consume daily, you sort of are a bit more cautious about it maybe, and you just need a little bit more of a push to want to do it. So are you all happy that it's, with all of this innovation, creation of new companies that are focused on all of the sort of different issues that exist 
within our food systems today. Are you happy that it's all shifting fast enough? I think it is, actually. I think sometimes it, it, there's many examples where you can see, I don't know if you guys saw the petition, like um, people, 50 50,000 people signed a petition to get McDonald's to bring back plastic straws. Um, so I think it's easy to kind of focus on that and think like, oh God, like what's the point? But um, for example, the CEO of Unilever last year said that um, the, uh, their brands with a sustainable and ethical mission are growing twice as fast as their other regular brands. And that just shows that um, even though your study found that um, price is still kind of key, but um, our studies have found that when when all things are the same and this, there's an option with like a more sustainable ethical mission, people are going to make that choice. Plastic's taken 70 years to optimise and we're still optimising plastic now to make it better, to innovate it, to make it even more usable, to make it recyclable. So if you sort of look at some of these more natural and biodegradable things that might have been around for ages but we haven't started using them until within the last 10, 15 years, it will take a lot of time and a lot of funding to sort of get them to that point of innovation. It's going fast, it could go faster, but I think we need the bottom-up consumer-driven approach, but I also think we need the government policy. I think we need the help to sort of mandate some of this as well and trying to reduce some of these emissions if possible. Interestingly, overwhelmingly, there's the popular opinion in the food industry that the wastebasket is their best friend, which maybe logically, you know, you might think that too, like the more we waste, the more we go back and purchase things. But actually our studies have found that that's the opposite is true. Unfortunately, we are having to do the education of actually educating our, the food industry about this, for not, uh, like how, that this just isn't true, that the, the waste is, is actually bad for business. So do the three of you all feel that Food Inc has, has woken up and if you had a message for big brands, big food businesses, what would that message be now? Adapt or die. <laughs> Claire, Dom? That we have a huge problem with food waste. So food waste globally is the third biggest carbon emitter after China and the US. If food waste were a country, it's the third biggest global emitter. Um, and then we have abject poverty and people suffering food waste and having to choose whether to pay for energy to keep them warm in the winter or eat so there's this huge disparity and i think there's a lot of charities and a lot of work happening to try and bridge that so supporting that would yes. be our message i think with all due respect um charities are there obviously to bridge a gap but it's a gap that shouldn't be there in the first place because right. maybe i'm cynical but i think it's maybe a little too late to change the large businesses of today to to completely go in the other direction because they've just been so baked in like waste the linear system is so baked in um, but what we can do is is build the the future big businesses of tomorrow by giving them the right frameworks today so um, we, we we run a series of events we have a couple of podcasts kind of educating people on how, how to build that into their business models so I think we, business models yeah. need to change. Anyone in the audience want to chip in or ask a question? Glenn? If you had one tip that we could take away what you want from each of you, what you could do as a family of four, just one behaviour change that would help, yeah. uh, that we could take home today, what would that be? Actually, if you do have food waste, um, either recycling it or putting it into composting, that means you know, that you're taking that away from actually ending up in landfill. It will end up as fertiliser and you can put it in your garden. Mine's super simple. Like Honestly, uh, I love having just a box in my fridge that just says, eat me soon. And everything that is going to be going soon, I just put it in there and then everyone, because like, they're so busy, otherwise people miss stuff. Like Your whole family can see like what needs to be consumed first until our labels are available. If there's a supermarket near you, like one's called Hisby, they do everything's unpackaged, so you can go with your own jars or Tupperwares and just fill up with cereal or rice so you don't need to use all the extra packaging. Just, just not expect our policymakers to get to grips with the size of this issue to the extent, you know, the same extent as you guys are doing and that we can do as consumers. So it feels to me like if you're saying farmers can just plant non pollinating crops, you know, you need to lay down the law for people, don't you? There's a huge conversation to be around that. Should government and policymakers be involved in this conversation? 100%. Because consumer and bottom up is brilliant, but if areas like this can be mandated as best practice and then put into place, of course, that's going to speed things up. Uh, we've had a couple of run ins with uh, policymakers uh, with what we've been doing. We're kind of telling people exactly when to eat their food. Um, and I, the, the truth of it is there's no legislation in place to stop us from doing something malicious with our technology. Like, 
telling people to eat it, their food way too late and like there's nothing stopping us to do that so it's up to us and our own ethics to make sure that we do it properly and um, I think what we've realised is that we just need to start and then legislation is just going to have to keep up um, but because they're certainly not being very proactive at the moment. Thank you so much. Miriam is a research fellow in material circularity at the Burberry Material Futures Research Group at the Royal College of Art. And she's going to talk about how to transform food waste into new materials. Thank you, Venture Free, for inviting me to speak and for putting together this great panel and talks about food waste. <laughs> My interest lies into how to develop materials from food waste. So, for example, if we think at the clothing that we wear, for ex mostly we use <coughs> cotton, and cotton requires water, energy, and land to grow. What if we replaced <coughs> these materials with food waste? So the Burberry Material Futures Research Group has been set up through a gift from the Burberry Foundation, an independent charity, to promote and pioneer more sustainable materials and techniques in the UK. We integrate a STEAM approach that connects science, technology, engineering, arts and maths in an interdisciplinary way to apply radical thinking to develop more sustainable materials. So one of the main challenges in developing materials from food waste is transparency. So similar to the textiles industry, there is not one organization and one system that maps where food waste is coming from. And for this reason, uh, for example, for materials development, we need to find waste streams that can be upscaled. So we can't be working with domestic food waste streams because that would be like small quantities that can be contaminated. And for that reason, working with the food processing industries and their waste byproducts is a useful raw material for upscaling materials development. So <coughs> within this system, we need to look for low waste, low value waste materials. In the carrot industry, there is a wastewater uh, carrot uh, system that produces an orange foam that the workers describe that is similar to a tanning product. And then in the onion industry, there is um, orange, uh, sorry, onion peels that can't be otherwise used and are usually added to the soil to replenish it. So these are low value products that don't have any other purpose. So could we develop materials from that, for example? If we want to spin fibers and develop materials from food waste, we need to identify the raw material we can work with. And if we take, for example, a carrot, we would eat the carrot for food, but what if we could use the peels for developing materials? So thinking about what nutrients are available within the system. So we are applying material science to develop these materials from waste. So if we look at seafood shells, for example, which is a large waste industry and waste stream, Seafood shells contain uh, calcium carbonate, they contain protein, and they contain chitin. And chitin can be developed into fibers. Our ambition of the Burberry Material Futures Research Group is by July 2022 to build and test a prototype distributed and circular system. So we want to think about people being involved into the manufacturing process, in the recycling process, applying strategies to be particip participants in the whole life cycle of manufacturing and recycle, how to engage consumers, how to repair and refurbish, how to remanufacture these project products. And then we're looking also developing products, or we call it solution, because at this stage, stage we're not thinking about one product in particular, but it could be, for example, shoes. So if shoe designers and SMEs are interested in collaborating with us, they can get in touch. And all the work is for benefit for industries and SMEs to work with us, so to design this whole system. And every year we are at the London Design Festival in September, we're exhibiting the progress of our research, so you can keep involved and see how it's developing over time. Thank you. And I was wondering, are you also looking into like more the plastic, plastic production with uh, the polyester or elastane? Have you already found alternatives for that? That's synthetic. So we're looking at bio-based materials. So if we're looking at food waste and the bioeconomy, it's important that we keep a mono-material stream. If we would mix it with synthetics, there are different challenges in terms of recycling. There's currently only 
two or three technologies worldwide that can recycle mixed blend fibers of polyester. There's a very big one in the UK, worn again. And these processes will take a long time to upscale. And at the same time, plastics and synthetics have a lot of other challenges in clothing, for example, microplastics. But we are aware whenever we wash synthetic garments, they are released into the environment. So this is not an area we're looking at. Within our specific system, we are focusing on food waste materials. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to our panelists. <laughs> Thanks to our panelists. Thanks to Dayan, Miriam to our V3 team who put all of this together, to all of you for coming. Please follow us on our Instagram and there'll be a content round up there and also we will be sending everyone as soon as it's ready a copy of the research report. And we look forward to seeing you at our next V3 breakfast on whatever that's about. <laughs> Thanks, bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>